All right, welcome everybody to the next episode of Building Tech Talk, our fifth episode, big number five, and we are here at State, the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, and we are with Melanie Ross, a research manager here. Melanie, what do you research? So I'm uh, in charge of the Green Building Technologies Access Center, and we are part of ARIS, the Applied Research and Innovation Services Group at SAIT. So ARIS is uh, essentially where the majority of the research at SAIT happens. There are a number of different research groups, and GBT um, is uh, one of those groups. And we are also uh, funded through NSERC as a Tech Access Center, which means that um, we get operational funding to be able to do more and impact more of industry through our work. Fantastic. And of course, we're also joined by our resident experts. We have Scott Jenkins and Dr. Doug Brown of ZS2 Technologies. And Doug, I know this is a little bit, the, the green building technologies area in SAIT is a little bit of a playground for you. You've spent a lot of time here. So hopefully this is a little bit like old home week for you coming in and, uh, and seeing what's happening here. But Melanie, what what is happening right now at, at the uh, Green Building Technologies at SAIT that, uh, that you are really focusing on right now as far as research is concerned? So we actually have a number of research areas that we've broken our work into just to kind of keep track. Uh, green Building Technologies as, as an area is quite broad. So we focus in on um, net zero, uh, energy net positive energy uh, for buildings. Um, we look at uh, building integrated renewable energy systems of all kinds. We have a smart building management program where we're looking at uh, sensors and controls, data management, that sort of thing. We've MACA is our materials and advanced component assembly area where we're looking at materials themselves, material properties, integrity, um, integrating sustainability into all aspects of development and use. And then we have our architectural ecology uh, research area, which primarily focuses on the built form as well as the uh, landscape around it. Um, we consider things like water capture and reuse, um, xeriscaping, green roofs, greenhouses, um, all those sorts of things under that uh, kind of so, so it's a lot it's a lot, it's a lot. yeah yeah and, and matt you know this is actually where we are today we're right on the state campus of course and we're here at gbt but this this building is showcasing a lot of these technologies that your different groups yes, would focus yeah. on right yeah so we call the we call the building we call it the gbt uh, lab and demonstration center and it is literally every aspect of it is kind of a plug and play playground for research um from what we've used for materials to the renewables that are on the roof to the basement has a whole um integrated system for mechanical electrical um, and sensor technology where companies can come in and test out um, everything that they'd like to plug into a building and see how it works, monitor it, measure it. And then we have a number of um, workshop spaces attached to the building. We have our MACA wall library, um, which is a full scale wall, literally pieces of wall that you can roll out like a book on a shelf to take a look at the assembly. Wow. And then we have our, um, our solar energy lab uh, in a separate trailer at the back of the property. Fantastic. And I, I take a look at these walls and they're quite thick. Could you maybe just explain briefly what these walls are in this type of facility? Sure. Yeah. Um, so this building was finished in 2017. So we're already working on things ahead of what we've done here. This, uh, <clears throat> our facility is the first uh, commercial net zero building in Calgary. Well. Wow at the time and when you say net zero that means that it doesn't use any sort of uh, carbon dioxide in the production of its operational energy right exactly so we actually um while we do draw energy from the grid we are also putting energy back into the grid um, on state campus we have um our walls the thickness is because we've invested in um uh, I would say it's it's more than double thickness walls to uh, with um, with cellulose insulation in there. Um, a lot of different kinds of uh, assembly techniques going into that with extra layers of vapor and air barriers to um, reduce the air leakage. 
We have uh, adopted passive house principles across the design of the building. So we have lots of south facing windows with awnings so that in the summertime we can mitigate solar heat gain, but in the wintertime we can take advantage of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we have solar panels on the roof. We have solar thermal um, and we also have a solar carport Wow. Uh, covering an area. Yep, and, just out uh, there. That's yeah, right, right there. Just outside. And we actually don't need any of the energy from the solar carport. It all goes back into SATE uh, because we're so efficient in our building and with the systems that we've already put into place that um, we don't actually, I guess, have an energy bill by the end of the year. <laughs> Fantastic. So what, one thing, you know, just to sort of add to what Melanie was explaining and, and for the folks, you know, uh, viewing the podcast are interested, the, the building has a much higher R value, so thicker walls, passive energy coming in. But just as important is it's very airtight. So you don't have that thermal bridging to the outside. Because of course, we're here in Calgary, Alberta, and you know, in the winter can be very cold, you have some cold days, summer can be very hot. So that allows that there's much more even, you know, control of the inside temperature versus the ambient, right? And it's been designed for that. Absolutely. It's absolutely designed to to find a balance and to ensure that we have control over that flow. So if we want it to be hotter or cooler, we can control that rather than um, strictly be exposed to the elements and whatever's happening outside. Um, we actually, because the building is when it was designed was really a test case. And we're still learning a lot about designing to net zero and incorporating all these different kinds of strategies. We're constantly tweaking the building as well. So we're planning to build um, a solar light shelf on the uh, second floor um, because we're finding that even with the high Claire story style windows, we're getting too much heat gain and wow. we need to control that a little bit better. Um, especially because on the second floor is where we have our main office space. So we have people and computers and a lot of internal heat. It gets too hot. Um, mm. and That's this, interesting. Yeah. And then with the stack effect, we do, we do have air that, you know, the hot air does rise and yeah. draw out in certain areas, but that particular area where the office is, the ceiling is lower. And so we're, we're getting too hot. So we mm. have to come up with other solutions to figure out how to mitigate it. Right. So you made them building too well. And it's too uh, actually, it, it is actually too well built upstairs. It, it, yeah. <laughs> so one, one question though, you, so I didn't know, realize this is the first, you know, kind of effective net zero commercial size building in Calgary. Yeah. Have there been subsequent buildings and that the, you know, people have come here to learn about what's been employed, what was used for their buildings, whether it be residential or commercial, like are there further net zeros buildings yes. now that have learned from the lead that SATE and, and the GBT group has taken? Yes, we've actually um, built closer to 20 buildings that are along this line of thinking where we're looking at high energy efficiency and moving towards that net zero um, passive house style of building. So we've supported a few different developers in the city um, and across the province in iterations of their own homes and testing things out and moving things forward. Uh, so there's about, like I said, there's about 20 in total that we've been working on. Um, there are a couple uh, being built right now that are going beyond net zero. Um, we have the living building challenge project. It's the most stringent uh, green yeah. building certification system in the world. We actually have to achieve 5% net positive energy and water with that project. And then we have another one where we're working on um, achieving zero carbon. So bringing that piece into the mix. There are a lot of similarities to all these different certifications yeah. and classifications that I've mentioned, where the ultimate goal is, is really reducing energy and emissions, but there are different ways to achieve it. And so by exploring those different ways, we can share that back out with industry and say, well, you know what, here's what we built, here's what we learned, and let's work together and figure out if this works for you or if we need to do some sort of hybrid approach and so on. And take next steps. Yeah. I know the you know, from a embodied and CO2 and the materials, that's right up your alley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm very curious, Melanie, do, when we look at sort of these net zero or living building challenges, I guess one of the questions that always comes up is like, what's the price for these exceptional standards, which we should all potentially adopt and want to adopt, 
but when we're price sensitive, that that seems to be a, a, a common theme in the construction industry. Do you do you have a sense of like for a net zero building, what kind of premium you you would look at, sort of next to the minimum code standards? Right, and it's always a tough conversation to have around the cost. Um, I am a very big sustainability green champion. Um, but the reality is, is right now there still is a cost premium depending on what you're doing and how you're approaching it. Uh, certain aspects of how we design and build are now part and parcel of our, our just our repertoire, our, our just standard way, which is fantastic. That's what we're trying to do with mm -hmm. all of this research, all these certification programs. We're trying to push the bar so that our standard way of build, building meets a minimum standard of sustainability, um, knowing that there will always be that research component of that, that bleeding edge of looking into, okay, well, we perfected this. Did we really? Um, is there something else we could be doing? How could we improve this? Um, we talk about this building, the walls are obviously very thick. I mean, you look, you can, you can tell that yeah. they're really thick. And there's a cost to that. There's absolutely a cost to that. It's like having two walls stuck together. Mm -hmm. um, and there are different ways to construct that that are um, new and not a typical way of constructing a, a building. So you have to take that into consideration as well. And so we look at that and say, okay, now we need to bring that wall back down to a size where we're not spending as much on materials. We're training um, the trades so that they know how to build this kind of system um, with ease and becomes part of their standard build package as opposed to being something unusual with a, with a cost premium attached to it. And that's part of what we're doing. We want to support industry to be able to get products, systems, processes, ideas out to market and get some traction and prove that first it can be done and then get enough people interested that it starts to drive those costs down. Yeah. And, and commercialize it. And exactly. That's, and that's, you know, one thing I, I, I've seen with this building now, some of these other buildings, and we, we know a couple of the other buildings here in Cary, Alberta, and then throughout North America, where the costs seem to be coming down, mm. but then also the, whether it's the developers, the owners, the occupants, tenants are realizing that the savings from energy, you know, post build now in many cases will outweigh the initial materials costs. So I think we're, we're not quite there at the tipping point, but we're getting a lot closer. We are, we yeah. are. And part of that conversation is also convincing people that the cost over the long term, the savings should be part of the equation when you're at that sort of initial capital investment for building. Um, not everybody believes that they should be looking at that long-term savings, even though there is a savings there. The other piece that we're trying to do is look to the future and say, where do we think we want to be even five years from now? Where is building code going to be? Where is the National Energy Code for Buildings um, going to be in terms of how it relates back to a building that might be five or 10 years old? And what are those ramifications? And should we be building to an even it, higher standard? It, it's interesting. And I'll, I'll throw it back to Doug and Matt real quick. So the building code, you know, as we're having this conversation, um, we see for our prospective clients in British Columbia in particular with the BC step code, um, which has a requirement now, as I understand, I might get the year wrong, but by 2035, which isn't that far away. No, it's not. Every new building has to be net zero ready. So not quite net zero, but they have to be ready for it. So the codes are definitely driving things. And I don't know what else you've seen out there. Yeah, well, I mean, the code seems to be revisited every few years and it's getting more and more strict as we try and meet some of these sort of larger climate goals. Um, I find it interesting that a lot of what we're focusing not now on, which is the important part, is the operational uh, you know, carbon footprint. But as we become net zero and, and much more um, energy efficient, uh, that, that conversation is going to shift to the, the footprint of materials themselves because uh, they'll become a larger piece of the overall lifetime of the buildings. Absolutely. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was just thinking that as you were saying that, Doug, the, the embodied carbon is a conversation that's starting in some circles, um, not everywhere. It's not a, a, a known. I mean, we're still, we're still debating what 
constitutes net zero and zero carbon right now, the true definition of what you should and shouldn't include in those def in those calculations, the embodied carbon piece will become a big conversation. And I think it'll become a challenging conversation for a province like Alberta because we're quite landlocked. We don't have access to um, big um, manufacturing markets um, for things. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how much um, investment we start to look at right here in Alberta to be able to develop our own products and our own markets to support building. And I, quite honestly, I see Alberta as being a great central location for all the prairies to be able to do that. I think we can even serve the, um, uh, the, you know, kind of the, the inner parts of BC, um, better than, the coast, because of course you have the mountains to get through, and mm -hmm. um, and then you go straight across Saskatchewan and Manitoba. We we have some great opportunities to to kind of invest in our own kind of made in Alberta mm -hmm. products and services, and then also we're experts in the cold climate piece. I mean, we are north. Um, we're as north as you get for some of the major cities, um, and then. Um, and then we can then take our cold climate lessons learned and then work with the the real north of Canada mm. and and look at solutions for there as well. I think it's I think it's important to acknowledge those things and that it it's an it's a need that's a big gap right now in the industry. You said something interesting there about um, you know starting the conversation around embodied carbon. Uh, so let's do that here because <laughs> <All right. laughs> it's something that isn't really talked about at all. So let's let let's try and boost that conversation a little because it is an interesting topic and really one that I think the people at this table here can talk about a little bit and, and give a little bit more clarity around what that actually means. So maybe Melanie and Doug, I'll let you guys fight over who wants to uh, tackle this definition first, but uh, just looking for like, what what's the 30 second explanation of embodied carbon in, in the building industry? Melanie, you want to take it or you want me to? Sure. That, I'll, that was not that. much of a fight. I'll yeah. do, I'll do <laughs> You're such a Stop gentleman. I'll uh, I'll do I'll do the uh, the elevator pitch version, and then you can do the technical version. How's oh, okay. that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, in general terms, embodied carbon is evaluating the carbon that it takes to not only um, that's not only say emitting from a product. When we talk about energy, we talk about the emissions from that energy, but also looking at um, what it what it took to develop that piece. So um, let's, we've got tables in front of us. I'm going to use the example of a table. Um, we have a top that's made of a melamine. We've got legs that are wood. We've got some metal pieces that are holding it all together. Um, we've got some bolts and nuts and whatnot um, to fa as fasteners. Uh, and then we have all of those components need to be manufactured somewhere. Materials need to be extracted, brought to a manufacturing facility, create the components. A lot of times all these components are in different facilities and then they're brought together to be assembled and then they get shipped out to whomever is buying them. And every step of the way, there's energy being used in those buildings. There are people driving to and from those facilities to work. There are um, trucks delivering components and extracted materials and finished materials all, all over the place. Uh, and then when it finally gets into your home, you use it for a certain amount of time and then you decide, I don't like it anymore and it goes to landfill. Um, so we look at every single aspect of that to understand the true cost of carbon in all of those steps in one simple thing like a small table. Yeah, and, and that's a, a pretty technical explanation, but uh, the one piece that I would add to that just as a sort of food for, for thought is the fact that it kind of contradicts globalization in a little bit of a sense because we have these sort of global supply chains and, uh, you know, a lot of essential products now come in from China, massive CO2 footprint, uh, transporting those goods across the sea, potentially landing in a port and then landing on a truck and having to be shipped somewhere. But uh, that argument is still based on cost and, and places like China still produce goods at such a competitive price that the CO2 piece of that is, is kind of left wayward. But I think as we start to price carbon, and I would say pricing it in an embodied sense is a long way out, but I think that we're probably moving towards 
different ideas around um, consumers looking at different products that they're going to be able to purchase and seeing sort of like a calorie count when you go to the McDonald's or something like that, you're going to see CO2 footprints start to appear. Like a sticker or like, like a, a sticker. like when you go buy a car and there's the mileage or right. Energy mm-hmm. Star appliance. And this is going to start to guide. It'll be on the label for the, the table example you just gave. And, uh-huh. and that's what I'd like to see happen because I think that if we're going to truly start to look at broad scale decarbonization, we're going to have to look at the embodied carbon piece of a lot of these buildings. And, and yes, trees are, are you know, carbon neutral and um, a great product to use and sustainable and they go back to the earth um, easily. Um, but, you know, there's other pieces to that as well where uh, we need to look at like the, the resiliency of these structures, the safety of the structures. Um, and, and to me, a little anecdotally, I don't think we often talk about the opportunity cost of cutting down like a 300 year old tree and then planting a few trees. And, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of smart people who are looking at the balance of the whole equation, but, uh, it's something that, are you saying deforestation is bad? <laughs> that's, re- that's right. no. but he said it in a very nice yeah. way. <laughs> we, should, we shouldn't make jokes because it's something obviously it's. But is is there an opportunity, from what I'm hearing you guys say, is there something where we are looking at technologies right now that seem to be good for the environment and and a positive thing, but when in reality, when we look at them and and look at the embodied carbon, are we maybe missing a big piece of the puzzle where we could be just trading four quarters for a dollar and really ending up at the same place at the end of the day? Well, I think just that, that you know, we're joking about deforestation, but that is exactly that piece. And I think a lot of people understand that because they, you know, we, we know that cutting down our forests is not a good idea. We know that planting certain types of trees to replace those forests take an inordinate amount of time to grow back and give back what it was that we had before. So, I, I mean, I am a fan of the of introducing wood in a more robust way into the built environment because we use a lot of concrete and steel, steel on the commercial side. And with the cross laminated timber movement, um, which is uh, engineered wood, essentially um, taking off cuts and really um, the pieces that you can't use anywhere else and then creating what are becoming quite beautiful pieces of wood to use as structural um, components and buildings. So that that's a great solution to not just cutting down trees, but actually using waste product from that process, say from a paper mill or what have you, and turning it into something that's usable as a product. And I think that's one of the ways that we can support those conversations. So we're not saying, well, let's just all build in wood now. Um, but we're also saying, we shouldn't not build in wood because we're worried about, um, you know, the, the impacts. We need to find a balance along that continuum. And we need to find more creative ways, like using waste byproducts to, to create new things. Um, there's a big movement in, with hemp um, right now. We have a lot of hemp growers um, in Alberta. Uh, same with uh, canola. And a couple of other um, couple of other products that are grown by farmers, and there are byproducts to that process because certain components are used for food or or um, uh, oil, uh, cannabis. There's a lot of leftover material, plant material, plant matter from those processes, and we can turn them into pellets and 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 burn them in a stove instead of drawing on coal electricity we can um, integrate fibers from the hemp that's a big 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 thing right now is the hemp fibers into products like um, mats and 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 uh, and board for the wall and all sorts of building products and materials and from the wood world we can extract lignin from that process and that lignin is being touted as an opportunity to replace um, formaldehydes and other adhesives in products, including cosmetics, if you can imagine. Wow. So <laughs> there's creative ways to think about not only the products, but the waste products. And if we can use those waste products, that actually brings down our embodied carbon yeah. count because we're making use of every aspect of, of what we've generated um, rather than have waste and then 
waste energy literally and, and in full, producing full disclosure melanie's uh discussion you know uh, referencing cross laminated timber and some mm-hmm. of this these beautiful buildings now uh is not a segue to one of our future guests because we are going to be talking about that more because we're believers in that too there's some amazing things you can do and there's definitely a shift um but also then in the discussion with the waste streams from you know, hemp production. This is a very strong material. And I'm going to kind of toss it to you, Doug, about incorporating. And this this really goes to, you know, you and I talk about it every day about, you know, the material science piece of the built environment and how we improve that and using, well, one, one reducing waste, so prefabricated mm-hmm. offsite potentially, and if we can do that, but then incorporating some of these materials, plant-based, that have been around forever. And now I think the world is opening up, like what other uses are there? I know you've thought a lot about that. Uh, The whole concept around circular economy where we're reprocessing what used to be a worthless material into a value-added material is really at the heart, I think, of sustainability. Um, And so I think a lot of these conversations around incorporating waste products that weren't uh, really seen as advantageous before is really where the movement of modern material science is, is heading towards. And and as you mentioned, lignin um, processes and materials, you know, still being determined kind of weekly um, are emerging. And uh, it's kind of exciting to see all the different um, opportunities to, to take advantage of some of the things that have been out there and just not really thought about in, in as clever a ways. Um, so I, I would say that it's, it's exciting to be part of this sort of scientific movement. I totally agree. I, every day there's something new, like you said, that comes out and it, it's actually hard to keep up with everything that's going on. And, uh, the circular economy piece is coming up more and more often now, which mm-hmm. is, which I'm really appreciating. Again, I think it's a, it's a challenging area for a province where we're, um, a bit landlocked and away from some of those markets, um, People were, I remember people were up in arms about finding out that all the clamshell plastic was stored in, I think it was nine sea cans over in the landfill a couple of years ago. And it was because we didn't have anywhere to send it that was cost effective and could actually be turned and recycled into anything. So I really applaud the city for hanging on to it (laughs) and and wanting to do the right thing rather than just tossing it in the landfill. But we need more, I think we need a little more support in that area to create, um, a, a strong base with our local companies, our local manufacturers and developers um, to, to think creatively and to work together. To, to and there's a lot of know-how here in, in both Calgary. We look at SAIT. SAIT's a, a world leader, but Alberta and Western Canada overall. Absolutely. Absolutely. We often, so I moved here about 13 years ago and I'm from the East coast. And then I did some schooling in Ontario. Um, and lived in Toronto, and then we moved here. And I give that backstory because I feel like you know I've seen a lot of different ways of of uh, of handling um, knowledge and technology. And and I was quite surprised finding out the number of great sustainability based strategies and policies and things that were happening in Alberta that no one talks about. And I I, I still say as we were terrible at tooting our own horn in that realm. There's a lot of really good things happening here. There's some forward thinking um, and we just need to rally, I think, and, and, and share the stories um, and start to connect with each other to, to further those stories and, and those processes and systems and, and strategies that are out there. Yeah, and really one of those things that you, you talked about in Alberta specifically, and obviously we're the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, and Alberta really does have a history of kind of having that entrepreneurial focus and looking for opportunities to really, at the end of the day, make money. And what you're telling us today is, is that there are these opportunities, that there are these new products, these new byproducts we could be using. Do you find that that, that entrepreneurial spirit is here, that people are digging into these and, and wanting to build businesses around them. Is, is there that appetite in, in Alberta still? I, absolutely. I, I think there's a lot of people with really fantastic ideas. We have a lot of really qualified, intelligent 
people way smarter than I am um, that are out there that are ready to 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 launch new ideas. I am talking to a group of them right now. Um, <laughs> they're blushing. It's really, about you, it's really uh, about you. And I think that um, with a little bit of focused support opportunities like this to sit down and have a conversation, figure out, Hey, Oh, you're going to talk to so-and-so we did this project with them. Maybe there's a connection. Um, I've actually heard this week from two different staff members about some conversations they've had with the ZS2 team on some totally different things that, um, didn't strike me as an immediate connection. But once we chatted about it, I realized, you know what? Yeah, that, that does make some sense. And we need, we need to keep fostering that sense of innovation and support, um, whether it's through just being able to come to a facility and um, use a lab or, or get an introduction to someone or whatever that looks like. Um, ultimately, financial support would be perfect because it would mean that we could actually um, get somewhere with some of our concepts and our ideas. Uh, so I'll put that shout out out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's for everybody who's listening. <laughs> yep. Yeah, including mom and dad. <laughs> yeah, and, and on that front, like where you're talking about the, the financial incentive, really, and at the end of the day, that's also comes from the market and people wanting to purchase these products. So we're seeing a lot of people wanting to to create them, have new ideas, look at opportunities. What's the market telling you guys? What what are what's the building industry saying as far as yes, we want this or we need this area worked on or where are the opportunities if people are looking to to tackle some of these issues? Where's the market saying, yeah, we have a need for this right now? Um that's actually a really hard question to answer. Uh, partly because we have our fingers in so many pies. Um, there's certainly still a lot of focus on energy performance, um, and emissions reductions from energy. Uh, so we're talking about our grid. Uh, we're talking about electricity and where it's derived from the fact that our natural gas is very inexpensive. It makes it very hard for people to make a switch to all electric, knowing that their energy bills will go up, even though they'll be using less. Um, it's hard to wrap your head around. Uh, and just, you know, we know that we have a lot of coal plants in Alberta. We want to phase those out. It is happening, but, um, you know, can, it, is it happening fast enough? These things, some of these things take time. We're talking about major, major infrastructure changes across the province from sort of our utility infrastructure. Um, and it's, it, it's not easy. Um, working with our builders, uh, the developers um, on, on what they're doing, they're very interested in innovating, but when our market dips the way that it has right now, it's very hard to sink money into R and D and developing, um, new home product, um, if you will, because people are struggling and don't want to pass on those costs to consumers. We want to make things as affordable as possible right now. So it's trying to find a balance between the economies of the world, mm -hmm. um, and the ones that are impacting our province. Um, and then also trying to help with innovation and identify the right products and the right trajectories to ensure that there'll be success once we come out of, because we will come out of the economic downturn. We always do. It's, it's always an up and down um, that we can be secure in that knowledge, but it's being able to shepherd the right things through at the right time. That's the really challenging part. We like to fail forward. I could say it that way. I like that. Um, yeah, it's not about... It's not perfect. It's not perfect. We're figuring no. it out. And every time we try it, that's why we have 20 houses under our belt that are trying different versions of net zero. The very first ones wouldn't qualify as net zero today, but they were necessary to be able to get to the point of learning and a applied knowledge that we have today in, in the buildings that we're building now. And even this building that we're sitting in, what we learned from this one, we're still tinkering with and we're applying to our newest projects. All right. Anything else to cover today? We've covered a lot of ground um, and given us all a lot of to think about. Is there anything, Doug or Scott, that we didn't cover that you guys are just burning questions to ask Melanie this? 
No, no I, I I would just uh, to touch because I think it's a great uh, two word synopsis. What Melanie just said, and then thank you again. This has been great, Melanie. This has been fantastic. Is uh, fail forward, and that's where you know obviously ourselves and our organization, but partnering with Sate, we couldn't have a better partner in the world. Thank you. And then we're pushing the envelope and continuing to push the envelope. You know, it's kind of who we and our broader team we want to just keep pushing, pushing forward. Status quo isn't an option here. Uh, but there's going to be challenges. And I love that phrase. And I'm going to probably steal it, but I'll reference Melanie every time I do. <laughs> you can steal it. You okay. can own it. You can own it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Melanie, for taking the time to talk to us today. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening. Be sure to subscribe on either Podbean, Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. Wherever you consume your podcast, make sure you subscribe to Building Tech Talk, Tech Talk One Word. And also check out the YouTube channel at ZS2 Technologies. So thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time.